Sweet and moaning Oh Lord It's sweet and moaning Mr. Joe Hendricks from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. We're at Miles College. Today is June 23rd, 1995. Ms. Hendricks, thank you for taking your time out to come and sit and talk with us today. What I'd like to do initially is just start with some general kinds of questions about your background. Tell me a little bit about your parents. Where are your parents from? My parents were raised in Green County, uh, a place they call Bolige down south. Bolige, Alabama. Bolige, Alabama. Near, near Manchway, Alabama. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, were you also born in Bolige? Right. Okay. Uh, how many brothers and sisters? You I, have? I had nine, it was nine of us, eight brothers, okay. four sisters. Okay. Where did you fit in there? Were you the Youngest. I'm close somewhere in the seventh child, or eighth, somewhere in that area. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, tell me a little about your parents' education. Did they? How much education did they have? Well, it was wasn't very much education going mm -hmm. with my parents, yeah. because my parents' daddy and mother was on the slave masters. And out of that, they had to get whatever was pretty well left. And they was on the, the Hoover days. Back in that day, back when wasn't anything very much for black people to do, especially on the farm. And they didn't have anything to get an education with. Matter of fact, even after I got up, it was left to a community to educate a, a child, not a family. How do you mean it's left up to the community? Okay, when, when they met, like we meet on Sunday now, they would, would raise money to send that girl who was off in college so she could continue her education along with the community. It wasn't enough money, more or less, to, for most families and no home there too much for the send a kid to school. They first started by the churches and the community getting involved with a kid when you found a good student. Mm -hmm. so, so out of that, it wasn't any chance for very much education mm -hmm. cause you know, under the, under the slave master, it wasn't allowed. That's right. In fact, it was against the law yeah. to, uh, to teach black people to read and write. Um, what about their occupations? What kind of work did they do? They were farming, only thing that they had, and maybe go out to cut timber uh, in the winter to do something like that. Okay. And that's about all they had to do with and okay. farming and. Yeah. Was your father a farmer? Did you, did you have a farm? My father was a farmer. He okay. did. And your farm. mother worked at home, I assume. Did she work no, outside of the home? At that point, there were no such thing as nobody worked at home. Everybody farmed in our house. Okay. Mother went to field, daddy went to field, and the children went to field. Okay. They put me in the field when I was five years old, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> But did, uh, did you own your own farm? Did your family own the farm? No. Okay. Were you they, sharecropping? It was a, they rent it. They, they rent, rent something rent. and pay so much a year. I see. Uh -huh. And tell me a little about your education. Um, My education was, I went to Jane Wood Junior High and I went to the ninth grade, and there was a, that was the length of that school. So after that, I came to Birmingham after I 
after ninth grade yes, in the Birmingham. Because. Did you attend school here in Birmingham? No, no, no. Okay. I came here and started to work. Oh, I see. Um, tell me, what do you remember about your school? What the is school that I about went your to? school that you went to? Um, well, the school was set up for It was set up first at a, okay, thank you. The school now that you, tell me a little about what the school was like. Tell me what the school was like. How do, what do you remember about your school? Going to school there, they had, well, teachers, Various, very some, because at that time, anybody who finished high school <laughs> seemed to have been teachers, mm. because it was in the area where very few people went to college. And more or less, our teaching were from 12th grades to a BS degree. Mm -hmm. And that's what yeah. more or less they had to offer. How how regular did you attend school? Was did were you in school every day for nine months out of the year? Uh, how did that process work? Well, my schooling was very scarcely done because I went to school like like went to school like three months out of a year. Three months out of a year. And most other time until I got fourteen years old. I was out of school. Mm. I only went about three months because everything was real bad and we didn't have the sufficient clothes and things to attend as we should have. So those kind of things kind of throw things kind of rough. Yeah. So, but we, uh, after 14, then I started going for the regular after that. Mm -hmm. And you, after school, after ninth grade, you left uh, and came to Birmingham. Right. What were the circumstances? Why did you come to Birmingham? There wasn't any money there, too much. And I felt that I'd come here, because I had some brothers here, had left, and they was doing pretty well, and I thought I'd come here too. Mm -hmm. So what, did you, what was your first job when you came to Birmingham? I came here and went to Jim Dan and stayed there for 38 years. Oh, is that right? You started oh, at Jim Dan and was there for 38 years, never 30 had another years. job. Hmm. Okay. And worked there until they closed, left there, and I went to Lama Jack, meat, mm -hmm. what a uh, kill, prepare meat for the market. And I left there and went to Hayes Aircraft, and that was about it until I started working some for myself. I see. So in, when coming to Birmingham, you came to Birmingham then in the mid-40s. 46. In 1946. Uh, at that time, I guess the NACP probably was the, the movement in, in Birmingham. We, did you get involved with the NACP? Uh, yes, the, I was involved with Mr. Patton and, uh, before the movement, so, and then when the movement started, I thought that was the biggest thing that really to help out people. Okay. So that's what I did. Got with them and tried to do whatever I could. Yeah. What community did you, did you live in in the 40s and 50s and early 60s? Why did I what, live? Yes, sir. 14th Street and between 3rd and 4th Ave Avenue, across from Edward. Okay. Chevrolet. All right. Uh, that's really in the in the Civil Rights District now, right? Yeah. In, right near the Civil Rights Institute. Okay. Um, were you a did you become a registered voter? And what were the circumstances? Yes, as soon as we could. We had a lot of hassle with it. Uh, registration started like they give us a real hard time. We had to, our application to feel like the Belmont Short Route 
all of the senators that we had in Washington, all of the officers in Montgomery, our Birmingham district, all those kind of questions we were, were to answer before we could vote. Then after we got into that, then some people could pretty well handle it, put it good, and we was voting and put it, getting into it. And they felt that we should be making any progress, so they put the damp on. And they start asking questions that weren't in answers. Like and they would pass. What kind of questions? Were they they would ask you, like, how high is height? How far is distant? How many bubbles in a bar of soap? And those kind of questions. And that put the damper on to start with. After that, then, after we got some clearing on to go ahead to move that, then we moved into the area of getting some voters qualified. Right. Do you remember the day that you qualified to become a voter? No, really. When <laughs> it's years past, you know, you, you, you sure. don't uh, yeah. keep up with But you do remember day some of day. the questions that were asked you yes. uh, in, in qualifying you to vote. Yeah, those are the questions, some of the things we ran into mm -hmm. in the process of it. Right. In, 19, we, in 1956, the NACP was outlawed from operating in the state of Alabama. And that same week, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights was organized. Uh, were you involved in the initial organization of the movement? I didn't hold an office, but I did go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I was active from the day that it started because everything went well, I thought. And I thought that was the biggest thing and the best thing for us uh, that had it ever, ever happened on my part. So I gladly start taking part and stayed with it as long as it was seemingly doing something worthwhile. What do you remember about the first days of the movement? Well, I think the first days of the movement, they said they're going to meet somewhere and they finally ended up meeting at, I believe it was Sardis Church. And they organized there. And from that, they went Forward. I believe that was something like 56. That's right. And from that day, they started meeting. Mm -hmm. And you, they started after that, later on, they started every Monday night. We'd have a mass meeting. And everybody was looking forward to Monday night. So that's. Mm -hmm. well, when you attended the mass meetings, how would you describe a typical mass meeting? What was it like? Well, the mass meeting was set up on mostly what we know, based on prayer and someone would speak, and we eventually got a musical uh, department, and we had a choir, a mass choir, and. Those kind of things. That's what it was put well uh, based on. And they would take up collection. And this is the form that we use for to uh, fight the cases in court. Right. Now, the, the meetings, some people have described the meetings to be like revival sessions. You know, there would be preaching. There would be people that testified, uh, testified in relationship to what, what they had experienced. Uh, uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth was speaking. Others would speak as well. Well, they would have a speaker every night. Mm -hmm. It was based on the same operation as pretty well church service. That's what it was. And we would have a minister and the choir and devotion with prayer and those kind of things. Were police present at the meetings? Yes, most policemen was outside at some point, mm -hmm. but they wasn't wasn't really. We didn't feel that they were there for the right purpose, mm -hmm. 
So we had our own guards along with the policemen on the outside. So we did, we someone always pretty well stayed outside with the policemen. So did we had you, a mass meeting. Did you look at the policemen as being there to protect you? We didn't feel like that was the purpose mm -hmm. of them being there. And we tell them sometimes we didn't, we appreciate you being here, but we don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. with you. Just without being somewhere to know what's going on, some what I said. Were there any instances, for instance, on the way to the mass meetings or, or, or after the mass meeting when you were headed home that you may have been stopped by the police? Well, I was going to uh, guard duty out to uh, Reverend Shelworth House when I was stopped by the policeman. And they asked me for my driver's license, and I pulled out the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights card and give them that. So it was about 15 cars of policemen in a dark place, you couldn't see anything. And they said to me, give me your driver's license. And it wasn't courteous, courteous at all. And it was using the word nigger and this kind of thing, you know. And I uh, was kind of shook up. <laughs> Why did you give them your movement card? Well, I couldn't see anything. Oh, so it was a mistake. <clears throat> when I went for the bill for the movement card was hard with the, like the driver license with the little uh, plastic. The driver license was, had plastic hard. And I just felt something hard because there wasn't no light. And when I come out, they say, and then he shined a light on it. He said, Alabama increased the movement for human rights rather than the driver's license. And I thought it was a driver's license when it wasn't. So. Well, were you afraid at that point? Yes. You said there I, were 15 police cars? The way they surround me, I know there wasn't, it wasn't a good sign. They just pulled around me and stopped real quick. And I know it wasn't a good sign. And where they stopped me, it was in real dark, no light at all. So they seemed to meet. And they said to one another out there, said, what we got to do with this nigga? I, and the other one said, eventually I heard him say, if we kill him, then what do these other niggas go, what the other niggas going to think what belongs to this movement? So at that point I said, then, this is that's it. <laughs> and then when they finally made their suggestion, one of them asked the question, if we kill him, then if it leads back to us, then what these other going to think? So they finally said, well, we better let him go, because if it leads back to us, then we're going to have to answer to the call. So they let me go. So actually the car probably saved you that night. Yes, I think the card was him. in my favor, but at my feeling it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But sometimes God has a way mm -hmm. that you don't have to get things done. That's my feeling. That was really what I ended up after saying afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you then were one of the guards for Shuttlesworth Home and Church, and I assume other places as well. Can you tell me how that operation was, was, was set up? What was the... The, uh, uh, the, the next door neighbor, next door to Reverend Shelway's house, we had a screen in porch where you could see out of the porch all the way around. And we were set up straight across from the church and we could see on the side and all the way on both sides of the church in the front. And then we had a fence on the back so that's why we would sit in. And what, we could stay there if it was raining or whatever and be able to see. When you were close enough to the church to see anything that goes on. Were you armed? Do what? Did, did you have arms? Did you have guns? We had a few shotguns hit out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you ever had, ever had the occasion to have to use 
any of the guns. No, we didn't. We had a occasion where maybe someone might have thought that he, they, he had bombs brought there. And the man said he wanted to get into the church so uh, the preacher could pray for him. He had a whole five gallon of dynamite on a, on a raincoat. Was this a white man? White male. And when we pursued, when we pursued to find him, uh, to find out what he had or check him out, then he would never let us get close to him. So he finally tried to take off and ran. He dropped it in the street and blew the whole, I guess, to, uh, six feet or something like that. Four to six feet in the in in in, in, the, in the street out there yeah. while he dropped it. You were on guard the night that this happened. Yeah. And you you approached him, and he wouldn't allow you to get very close to him. And then he they wouldn't he let ran. him get. I believe a fellow named John L. Lewis did to close in on him more so. I see. We called him that. I don't know what <laughs> his name was, but all of us called him John L. Lewis. But. Mm -hmm. He was out there too, so he closed in on him pretty close, and somehow he dropped this dynamite. Were there other encounters? And the one was out the church and big hole in the street. Mm. Were there other any any other encounters that you had while you were on guard duty that you remember? Well, we had several case, uh, cases where they would come out there with threats, you know, and. Uh, mm. But you couldn't pursue anything. We, our job was to try to stay away from trouble, mm -hmm. not make it. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you were arrested once because you sat on a bus. Can uh -huh. you, you you sat on a bus? Yeah, in the front first of case. Side. Can uh, you can you describe that experience to me? Well. Uh, I came through town, and they were on every corner. Who who are they? Uh, white brothers, white people, had congregated on corner. They had chains and bit of billy clubs and sticks, and they said to one another, "What time shall we go get here?" I what you call them. Uh, and I go to the next corner, up to the next corner, and they, they was asking for him. So I then turned and went on out to show Reverend Show his house. And I said to him, this is the wrong day for you. I said, you better give me that pad and let me go to town. He said, well, what about your job? I said, well, your job won't mean as much as your life or whatever those people have planned. This just ain't the right day for you. So. I pursued to go on and follow through with whatever he had planned and what I felt was best to that I should do it, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, let him get walk into that kind of situation. And what what had he planned for that day that you eventually did? What had I planned? What had he planned? You went on to do what he had planned for that particular No, I was planning to go with him. I see. Anyway. And uh, after it was seemingly it gonna make a problem for him, then I was willing to do whatever I was necessary to do on my part. Did anyone else go with you? Yes, we had like, I guess 15 to 20 people. I don't know exact, okay. at least 12 to, uh, and to go me. to jail that day. Okay, so how, how, did, how did it actually happen? What did you do? Well, arrested. we went and sat on the bus, and the, the bus driver said, move to the back. And we said, we're comfortable where we is. I don't see any reason why we should go to the back. So we paid our fare, and we feel that we are comfortable where we're sitting. And we stayed where we're sitting. So instead of them, I caught a bus going to Inslee. And instead of them taking me to Inslee, they took me to the bus tournament and pull us in, up in between some more buses there and call the policeman before we left town. 
called the Expatia, and they they were the one ordered them to not go on the route to take us down to the bus tunnel, and from that they called the paddy wagon to take us to jail. So they arrested all fourteen or however many. All the was. people that was on the bus, what was what was up other side this black white boat. Right, right. So how many days did you spend in jail? Five days and six nights. <laughs> but the worst part of it was they sent us up, and then the jury turned around and said, send them back a day. The last night were sent us, sent us back to jail before this respect he had for the other jury, then bring us back to court the next day, which I never did understand. Was this, what, what do you mean the other judge? What happened to the other judge? One who sent us, uh, sent us back to jail overnight, and then we had to come back to court the next morning. Mm. Before see. another judge, before he, and he relieved us after that. For I some see. reason, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Were you ever arrested uh, at any other time? Mm, I don't think I was arrested any other time. Did you did you take part in sitting out at the airport? Well, they didn't arrest us at the airport. Okay. At the airport, they it was a matter of trying to be served as any other citizen in a, in an airport restaurant. And they refused to serve us for a whole week. So that day we set up three groups. The first group would go on it when they opened. The second group would come on at 10. And I happened to be on at 10 to 12. Mamie Brown and Jim Hendricks and Joe Hendricks and I believe Hattie Felton. I think that right, but I know Mamie, Joe, and uh, well, two of the people, and uh, three of the people. But instead of them serving us, I think a ham sandwich and a drink, what we ordered, it was a dollar eighty-five cent. But the manager came out and instructed them to charge us five dollars and 85 cent for a dollar and 85 cent sandwich. So some of them didn't want to pay it, so I offered whoever didn't want to pay it, I'd pay it if she'd give us a receipt. So she pursued that she would, and whoever didn't want to pay it, I went on and paid it. And that was public accommodation, she said, and she didn't feel like she should serve us, and she felt that we were special guests, so she charged us $5 extra. So we paid it, and we took it on the court, and Constance Marley represented that case. And she did real well. She was, she really represented us. And wherever she is now, I can appreciate the way she done it because she turned and give all of the lawyers which were there to sit in on the case, every book that was in the library, she asked them to go get it. And then she turned and give them the book she had. And then she went from page to page, which protected the public accommodation. And she turned to them and gave them her book. And she went from, she said, Article 6, Paragraph 7, page 26. And she gave the statement through the whole thing without reading any of it. So, so she really knew what she, she was doing. She knew the law. But she, you used that sandwich, that dollar eighty cent sandwich that you paid five dollars and eighty yes. cents for, you use that as evidence in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So this were I think for the best thing, best case, I think for the best for the people because it read that no black or white can be seated in no public building 
in the state of Alabama. And that's what they had on as law. Can be denied a Well, uh, the person who run the restaurant wanted to serve you. They would be in violation of the state law. Right. So this came to the test, and we won this. So this was a big effort, I thought. I see. In 1961, uh, we had a group of people called Freedom Riders who started their trip in Washington, D.C., and was headed to New Orleans. And when they arrived in Alabama, some things took place. You had some, you played a role in that. Can you explain that to me? What role did you play? After these people had been there for something like a week, three or four days or something, Where was longer, been in, in, in Aniston. Aniston, Alabama. Okay. And I felt that they was trapped there, and I consulted the leader about it, who was Reverend Shelway. And he said, if I felt that way, or if we felt that way, I think we should go. He wouldn't, he think we, somebody should go check on him, that's way he put it. So we pursued to go there. And those people were vicious, seemed to have been mad about something, I don't know what. And they had formed a white people on the street out there to stand over us with guns and intimidate us. I mean, this is in Aniston? In Aniston. Okay, just before you get to Aniston, though, how, did, how was the decision made that you were going to Aniston, and how many people went with you? Well, we, we, we formed a carpool to go there to pick, pick them up by how, car. How many cars? We had take? like 15 or more cars. And we went there to pick them up. And how, how many people were you going to pick up? Well, we didn't. We, we carried like one person to a car, not more than two, because we left space for the people who were there if we could get them to bring them back. So that's where we went. Was, was there any difficulty in getting them uh, to come back with you or? Was, is there we had difficulty out of the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department at that point was on duty at the hospital. They had them in the basement at the hospital. Oh, they were they were not at the bus station. They were at the hospital. Yeah, because they had Downstairs. been beaten. Was because they had been beaten. They had been treated at the hospital. Right. They were downstairs on, in the basement at the hospital, and we couldn't get in there until the these uh, sheriff let us in. And they made us stop out on the lot before we got to the hospital. And we had to communicate with them. So I asked the other people to stay back because the tension was so high and the people were so brutally mad, seems to be. And they had all those guns. So I asked the other people to not go and let me go up and see if we could, how could I get them relieved. So he finally said to me, if you want to take the chance, I wouldn't do anything to help you. I wouldn't protect you, even if something would happen to you on this hospital yard. You own your own. So in addition to the, sh in addition to the sheriffs and police that were there, there were other whites who were mingling in that area? Yes, it was other whites on the street before we got on the lot had stopped us and stood over us with those all kind of guns. I had a flat and they stood over me the whole time I was fixing my flat and they ran me out to the service station and wouldn't let the people in the service station fix it. So we pursued to go ahead and get my spare out of the trunk and fix it that way and they just stood there with the guns as if they was out there hunting for us or something, or, uh, as we were some good animal or something. Now, Birmingham is about 60 miles from Aniston. How did you know that the people were in Aniston and stranded? 
well, it was on the news, and 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 by me being active in the movement, we knew that they 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 were there, and we had had location of where they were. Now, were these black people or white people that were stranded in? in uh, black Amazon? and white. We had even four white ladies in the crew in the group, and they the whole. Men who were with me was actually afraid to let them ride back because it was so much animosity and so much bitterness there. And we just, I just take an initiative to load them in my car, the white ladies, and into my best friend's car, which was Forrest Washington. And we got them, got them back to town. But no one wanted to, let, it was so much no one wanted the white ladies in that car. Why not? Because of the the guns and the way the people was acting and the way they was treating us. So that was the reason. And by being white ladies in a black man's car riding down the street <laughs> by these guns and all these people and the way, they, the way you know how they feel about that, that was the reason. And you had 60 miles of rural route to get yes. between Anderson and Birmingham, right? So they came back to Birmingham, and when I got here, I had the same problem. No one wanted to deal with the white ladies. Then nobody would take them. I said, well, then all white ladies load back in my car, come and go home with me. They hadn't had a bath. They hadn't had anything of that sort. So I take them home, and my wife, they told her to go in and make a way for them to take a bath, give them some clothes. She give all of them something to put on, a change in. in. They put the clothes on, walk back home, and mail them back. So you that were, cleared that up. What part of Birmingham did you live in at the time? What part of Birmingham was I living in? Yes, sir. Over in Tillisville. Okay. So, Hunter Circle Circle. All right. So you brought them to your house. Right. Did, were you approached at all by the police when you got into Birmingham? Did they know that you had gone to Anderson and you were coming back with the Freedom Riders, with white women in your car? And did they approach you? Or did you have any difficulty once you got back to Birmingham? No, I didn't have no difficulty after I got here. Somehow, I have been blessed that difficulty would go up to a point, and I feel that somehow God has always held it off for some reason. I have never been hurt violently. I have seen everything up to that, but I have never been really hurt. I've been pushed, I've been doing a few things like that, but really to be really struck like I've looked and see them do other people. I've never been hit. I've seen them hit other people. Uh, so you've been rather fortunate in that regard. You've right. never been attacked. I feel that the prayer I prayed and the prayer that I have said have been answered to that point. And that's my feeling. I don't feel that it's nothing I've done uh -huh. that has been so protected for me. Right. But I feel that outside of me that somebody was big enough to really get it done through him. And that's my feeling. I don't feel even today that I am credit for nothing that has been done, but only through what I've been allowed to do as a tool and instrument for him. And I've heard the impact of Dr. King with the same idea, don't give me the credit. Right. And if you ever get yourself into it, you'll find that you don't want credit. I, I, I'm not here feeling that I don't have any credit for what happened. What had happened. Mm -hmm. I feel that the glory to God, the glory to whatever were bigger than me, somewhere, somehow bigger than me, right. to make it be what it was. Because I've been shot at, I've been missed, 
I've been talked about in a death row line, and it has been so before it got to me. The bullet has been tuned before it hit me. And somehow I feel that it's just one of those things that somebody did something that had something to do with it more than me. Now, that's my feeling. Right. Did, uh, you, did you participate, I'm sure you did, in demonstrations during the 63 marches? Yes. Between April and May of 1963, the demonstrations? I was even out there when we set up the Stratic for downtown uh, city. Mm -hmm. When they set up that strategy, there were a man sitting out there with overalls on, which wasn't seemingly uh, having anything to say. And he came out and set up the strategy for to get downtown. Everybody go out there. You remember when he knocked Fred down with the hose, and everybody go out there, they just turn him over with the hose. So a man sitting out there without because he wasn't even thinking about anything. He, and he got up, he said, let me help. So he stood up, he said, all oh, y'all line up. He said, give me four men over here, four men over here, four men over here, and all y'all ladies get in the mill. And when he set it up like that, then they took off. Said, now y'all going through. He said, when the water hose hit you, all of you lean this way. And when the water holes hit them, <laughs> they ain't stop walking. <laughs> like I said, the people, when they organized the strength against the other person, they went on downtown. Who was the man in the overalls? I can't think of his name, but all I know at that point, he had on some overalls, <laughs> and they're sitting there, that's an ordinary person. Mm -hmm. But those are... Uh, that's the way we got downtown. Cause until as long as we were single, trying to get downtown, as fast as we get to the war hole, they turn us over. Mm -hmm. But in that day, I refused to go to jail because my job was more important out of jail. I felt because I had two cars, which people didn't want to be done carrying those wet children home. And I went far as the airport, I went far as Bessma, I went far as Brighton. I went to all of these places to take those children home after they got wet. And I felt that that, was, that day was more important than going to jail. Because a lot of us wouldn't want, I mean, a wet, wet child, five or six of them in their car wet one behind another. But service to me has more to do than a car to me. So you didn't mind the children getting in your car, wetting your seats up. This was a service that was necessary at the right. time. So whatever was necessary, that's what you did. Your family was intimately involved. In My whole family were involved. My oldest daughter, I guess she, she's already been here for an interview. She went to jail. My wife was secretary for the movement. My uh, baby was in, in line for the jail, but they, they begged us to bring the oldest one back home <laughs> after she went, so that saved the baby, so I was going to take her to jail the next time I went. But the whole house was in motion to go. I've never felt more better. I didn't know how my wife was going to take it, losing my job and losing all I had. But she is in support to it. Did you ever lose your job? Yes. You did lose your job at Jim Daniels? Yeah. But I regained it. <laughs> Everything that I feel like, if you ever read the story of Job, Everything that has been taken from me, uh, everything I thought was going on the dream, uh, has been given back to me. So I don't feel like a loser. <laughs> I feel like there is more of this that all of us should 
fine to do until we balance out. I even feel today that we could regain in our community back. Well, tell me just briefly about the circumstances of you losing your job. What are you saying? The circumstances that, that caused you to lose your job. Why did you lose your job? Well, when I got involved with that, I got in the paper. And the person who I worked for was white. And he was with his white brothers. He said, they said that they didn't want to work with me. So he said to me that they, their job was more important to them than my one job. So he had to let me go because nobody who was white wanted to work with me. So he pursued to take me in the office, and we sat there and talked. And we conversed like this. Uh, he said to me that I got to run this job with these people. And I said to him that if you run this job, aren't you supposed to make decisions? He says, yes. I said, well, I'm confused. He said, why are you confused? I said, I'm confused because you make decisions. And you're telling me about who works on the job when it's, a time, when it's time for you to make a decision. And it's not based on what they think. So I would like for you to make a decision. So and he made the decision. When he got around to it, I said, now, I want you to tell me. He said, why, why was you going and what you done on the bus? <laughs> where were you going and what you done on the bus? I said to him, I rode the bus. I was trying to go to Inslee, and I ended up in jail. He said to me then, what you done on the bus? I said, well, I was going to end it. I said, I ain't up in jail. He said, well, I don't feel that you should have rode the bus unless you rode it where you supposed to have rode it at. I said, I rode it where I supposed to. I paid my fare, and I just got on there, and I was comfortable and sit down. But I'm confused. I said, now you feel that I should be fired. And you got people who's on this job who have stole from the company, you didn't fire them. I say you got people on this job who have killed and been convicted for murder, you didn't fire them. I said, why is it that you find me for riding a bus and you can't fire the people who stole from the company and who have killed people? So he said to me then, say, you was all sick, wasn't you? I said, yes. Yeah. And you rode the bus? He said, yes. He said, well, you go back to the doctor and come back to work tomorrow. <laughs> so he had my answer me, yeah, I'm still waiting on the answer. So you, he didn't fire you then? He did, but when I asked him the question, rather than the answer, it seemed like he'd give me my job back. <laughs> okay, so you're talking back. Into okay, those are very interesting pieces. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we may not have covered that relates to the movement? I think that the only thing I think that in the area of success has been the movement. And I think all of us as blacks should look at the jobs that we have and try to stay within the area of where we are, not retreat to become so complacent that we feel that it just automatically happen. And we, we should always be mindful of what we are and where we are. And we don't have anything to lose. We only ask for what we own because it rightfully belongs to us. And that's what my feeling, that has always been my feeling. We only ask the people to move over and give us as they call at night, what you niggas want now. I would always answer them by saying, we want the same thing you all want. Well, I'll be over there. 
Come on, I ain't always entertain my guests. And this is the way I would put them when they call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock at night. And I feel that the people should feel the same way now. We only is trying to claim what we rightfully own. So they could not and intimidate you. We're not trying to claim you. anything lost to anybody else. They were attempting to intimidate you, but that right. intimid they attempted to intimidate you, to scare you so that you would leave the movement and stop. Oh, yeah, I've had two place. or three cars come watch me cut grass. <laughs> So, yes, they, 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 I've had white ladies to call me and try to get me out at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. I've had all this, you know, all these good, all these good things happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But okay, well, you, it's just one of those things. You have to be aware sure. of it. Mr. Hendricks, I want to thank you for coming and taking your time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. And we will definitely be in touch with you in very short order. We'll make copies of this. and and I uh, have you to review them. Thank you for coming. No, 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 no. Sweet oh. and my